Hi, I'm David Sargent, president of Riptide. I'll be going through the diagnostic procedure for the SL model vacuum using the diagnostic toolkit that's included with the unit. With the use of this kit, you can easily diagnose any problem. As I go through the procedure, I'll reference the plastic cards that you'll find in the kit. I've laid out all the components that make the vacuum work, so I can talk a little about them before continuing with the diagnostic procedure. Let's start with the battery. Make sure you choose a deep cycle 12 volt battery. Most people use a group 27. This is the size designation and it's indicated on the label. It's a good idea to buy a sealed battery or at least lay the battery on its side to make sure it doesn't leak. If it leaks even a little bit, don't buy it. Also, take notice of the manufacture date. It shouldn't be more than a couple of months old at the time of purchase. Next, there's the control panel. The control panel houses all the components that make the vacuum function. It's bolted onto the cart so it can be replaced in just a few minutes. Each individual component can also be replaced independently. It's very important to use a wrench when connecting the wire terminals to the battery. Then there's the vacuum head which consists of the cord and the motor. All right, that's all there is to an SL model vacuum system. Now let's get started with the diagnostic procedure. Okay, we're gonna refer directly to the diagnostic procedure cards. Before performing the diagnostic procedure, we're gonna load test the battery. That's step number one. Red on positive, black on negative. And we can see here that the battery is at 13 volts. Now when I push this button, it puts a huge load on the battery. This is actually a really strong battery. In fact, it's brand new. It's down around 11 volts or about 11 and a half volts right now. You're gonna hold that switch on for about 10 seconds. You're gonna smell it getting hot. You're gonna see it glow red like that. That actually indicates that it's a really strong, good battery. Don't be afraid of letting it heat up like that. All right. Step two says to be sure your battery charger is fully charging the battery. All right, that test clearly showed that the battery was very strong. If your battery was not fully charged and maybe a little on the weak side, it's possible your charger is not working correctly. So it's good to have a charger that charges uh, at least 10 amps. It's easier to do your cleaning and working on your battery while it's sitting right here on the ground. So if the terminals were dirty, I would go ahead and take the nuts off, take the wires off, clean the wires and the terminals really well, and then put it back together. And always, always, always use a wrench when you make that connection. It's a good idea to use some type of corrosion protection. This fluid film works great. We use it on the transport racks. We recommend it for your battery as well. We include a round wire brush in your diagnostic toolkit. That's real nice to use in a power drill. You can clean your contacts like brand new very quickly that way. You just run it up from the bottom. Okay, I'm gonna start with the diagnostic procedure now because we've tested the battery. We know the wires are good. Everything's ready to go to the next step. We're gonna start with step one here. Unscrew the large plastic grommet cap from the vacuum head. And if it's real tight, it helps to just use that and loosen it up. We'll spin it off. And then, step two, unscrew the watertight connection from the motor and pull the cord out of the vacuum case. We're gonna use channel locks because they are perfect for reaching in there and doing that job. Once you get it loose, it typically will spin off with your hand. And pull it right out of the way. Now that's gonna allow us to go to step three. Plug the motor test cable directly into the motor. This is in your diagnostic toolkit. Just got a couple of wires attached to it and it inserts through the vacuum case and into directly into the motor. Now we're just gonna take the wires and touch them to the battery. This will not shock you, it's not gonna hurt you, it's DC power and it does not hurt you. And touch the other one. That tests good. If the motor does not turn on, it needs to be replaced. If the motor does turn on, go to the next step. So if your vacuum head wasn't working, but the motor is testing good, we need to know what to do next. So step five, turn the control panel switch to the on position as shown and touch one wire of the motor test cable to each contact on the control panel plug. So we're gonna turn the switch on here. We're going to touch one wire to each side. If the motor does not turn on, there's a problem with the control panel. 
If the motor does turn on, there's a problem with the cord. Now keep in mind, if you determine that you do have a control panel problem and you want to, you can just order a brand new control panel and bolt and replace the whole thing. They are sold as a complete unit, but you can also buy each individual component. And the second note here, if the cord is determined to be the problem, it may be possible to repair it. The plug on the end of the cord is also replaceable. At this point, if you've determined you have a problem with the control panel, we can test the switch independently. We need to screw the cord back into the motor. Okay, just attach the watertight connection. I'm gonna snug it down. Don't get crazy tight, just snug it down a little bit. It's an O-ring connection. It doesn't have to be super, super tight but it does need to be a little snug. When you go to put this big grommet cap back on, take and put it between the blue plastic and the grommet and bend it around that point. And then that's just gonna screw back on. And it's helpful at this point to just take the, the grommet and use that to tighten the, the, the grommet cap. All right, step one says to carefully check all the wires and contacts for wear and damage. So it's not gonna to hurt to look in behind the control panel here, check your contacts, make sure everything's together nicely in there, and then we'll move on to step two. We're gonna test the switch. Test the switch by plugging the vacuum into the plug and jumping across the lugs with pliers or any other metallic object. It doesn't matter if the switch is in the on or off position. Let's take the plug off right here, plug it into the control panel like normal, it doesn't matter, like I said, if it switches in the on position or the off position. We're gonna reach in behind and test by touching the contacts behind the switch. All right, if the motor does not turn on, recheck the wires and connections and double check your test procedure. The motor did turn on, so replace the entire control panel or just the switch. If the switch was determined to be bad, it can be bypassed until you receive a replacement. Okay, so we've determined we have a bad switch. We're gonna bypass it for the sake of getting back to work. With a bypass switch, all you have to do is unplug the vacuum from the control panel to shut it off. So it works 100% and do this in just a couple of minutes in the field. So step one, it says use a uh, 17 millimeter deep socket and remove both nuts. It's unlikely you will have a deep socket in the field. We're gonna go ahead and use a pair of channel locks because it's much more likely that's what you're gonna have. We've got the two nuts behind the switch. Okay, with the nuts off, I'm gonna take the long black wire which is attached to the negative on the battery. I'm just gonna put it right on top of the short black wire and that in effect direct wires the battery to the plug. Tighten it up real good. This is just like the battery connection in the sense it has to be very tight. A loose connection will cause problems in the field. All right, the switch is now bypassed. To turn it on, you will simply plug into the control panel. To shut it off, you'll simply unplug it until you get your new switch in the mail and then replace your switch. And now on to page six, or the last page of the diagnostic procedure. Okay, so you've determined the battery is good, the motor is good, and the control panel and all of its components are good. So the problem has to be the cord. Step one, twist the spring counterclockwise and pull hard at the same time to remove it. Step two, remove the six screws using the T20 Torx tool, which is included in the kit. The contacts on the plug are 10 millimeter, so you need a 10 millimeter wrench. We happen to have one built into this torque bed. It can actually be helpful to take the bolts right out so you can really see and make sure that the wire is inserting all the way when you put it back together. Step three, cut the cord back beyond the damage and strip the wires as shown. Now this cord is brand new, but if it was a broken cord, it would be most likely broken right here because that's where it's getting pulled on all the time while you're vacuuming. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut it back like a typical cord repair would be. Now I'm gonna pull 
the old cord out and just make sure that the cord comes out completely or the old wires come out completely. I've already removed the bolts that make the connections so I can see that there's absolutely nothing left in here so you can make the connection once we strip the wires back. All right, I'm just gonna use a knife because it's the most common thing you'd have out in the field. And I'm gonna cut back the flotation cable. Just make sure you don't cut too deep so you don't damage the wires. You can do it with a knife or stripping pliers or whatever you have. Take care not to damage the wire underneath, of course, when you're cutting it back. And these threads here can be cut back as well. They're very strong Kevlar strands. Okay, now I'm gonna strip the individual wires. Don't strip too much, because if you do, you might create a short inside the plug. That's a little, not quite enough, so I'm gonna do a little bit more. I'm gonna do an even amount on both of them so that they insert nice and straight. We'll take and twist those wires together real good. And now it's ready to insert back into the plug and reestablish the connection. All right, we're ready to attach the plug. But before you do that, make sure your spring is on the cord. This orange grommet goes down. And then your cord grommet goes on this way. And now you're ready to attach the plug. It's preferable when performing a cord repair or replacing the plug to use wire ferrules. We sell a cord repair toolkit on our website that includes a packet of ferrules and all of the necessary tools to do a factory quality repair. With the ferrules in place, it makes it a lot easier to go ahead and insert the wires into the contacts. And you can see one's a slightly longer than the other, so at that point I like to just, just trim them up to get them perfect. All right, I took the bolts out completely because you can see that the wires are all the way through the holes. And again, make sure you put the red wire on the left-hand side. To repair the cord without ferrules, simply slide the twisted wires into the holes and continue the repair. Just keep in mind, we do sell packets of ferrules on our website. And we're gonna use the 10 millimeter to tighten those back up. You want them tight, but you don't wanna go damaging the wire. You just want a nice connection. And there you have it. That, now you can test it too. Pull on it, make sure that it looks like it's well clamped in and secured. You can see by this that it's actually a really good connection. Okay, make sure you put the grommet in place in this slot right here. and then you cap on top of the assembly. These short screws here are easy to strip out, so just snug them down a little bit. These here are much, have much more material to bite into, so they're fine. And then these will tighten up last. And the last step, slide the spring over the whole assembly All right, screw the spring on counterclockwise. And that's it, the cord is repaired. And that's it, that's all there is to diagnosing your riptide. Remember, always go to your diagnostic procedure. It will tell you how to go about it. If you need parts, you can go to the website to order. And if you need us, just give us a call. We're always here for you.